Have you seen that Charles Barkley commercial where the kids are lined up and uh, they're picking teams and the, the spokesman says that choosing whatever it is he's selling is even easier than choosing Charles Barkley for a kid's pickup basketball game. It's, it's fun to watch Barkley celebrate and says, yes, I still got it. And he turns to the kid next to him and says, I told you she'd pick me first. Well, that feeling of being chosen first must be exciting. Some of us remember that. Others of us remember what it was like to be one of those that were near the end of the line. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be chosen first for a basketball game. But to be chosen, to be called, how does it feel to be called by God? That is one of the things we're going to consider today as we look at the scripture. I welcome you to this online expression of worship from Pell City First United Methodist Church. My name is Rachel Gonya and I'm the senior pastor here and I am so glad that you have decided to join us. So we are this month talking about old problems and new beginnings. Often, as I said last week, there can be things that we go through that we feel like we are the only ones that have ever experienced that. But the writer of Ecclesiastes, as I said last week, says that what's been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. And so we are considering things that happen in our lives that are age-old problems that people before us have been through. And we're thinking about how they might be an opportunity for a new beginning in our own lives. Today's scripture comes from um, Exodus, and we are going to consider how we find ourselves in situations when we might feel inadequate for what God has chosen us to do, for what God is calling us to do. And in those times, we have to learn to trust God and to believe that God is with us. So the scripture is from Exodus 3, the first 12 verses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you. And this is the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. This is the word of God for the people of God. So I started out today talking about being chosen and about being the first choice, not the last resort. And here we have Moses trying to decline being chosen by God. Well, perhaps we might understand why Moses is reluctant if we looked at his life up to this point. 
I mean, Moses right now, the one who had been rescued from the river by, by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the palace, is now in the wilderness tending to sheep. How did that happen? Well, he had murdered an Egyptian when he saw him mistreating a Hebrew. And then he had not felt welcomed by the Hebrews when they had seen what he had done. They were suspicious of him as well. So he has fled and found himself in Midian. He's already married Zipporah and he has a son. And there he is tending sheep in the wilderness, having left his life in Egypt long behind him. But into his life at this point comes an angel visitation, a burning bush, the voice of God calling him. For many of us, this story might be very familiar. And when you imagine it, you may see Charlton Heston in that leading role of Moses, just like the great movie, The Ten Commandments. I mean, we see the burning bush. We, we understand the taking off the sandals because it's holy ground. Those images are part of our culture as well. But here in this passage, we hear God telling Moses that he has seen the misery of those who are being oppressed in Egypt. He wants to bring the Hebrew people out to a land flowing with milk and honey. Surely Moses is happy when he hears that part from God. He's excited to know, perhaps, that, that God will do this great work. But then next, God says, and you are the one who will go to Pharaoh. Immediately, Moses is like, what? Why me? Who am I to go to Pharaoh? You know, earlier in the passage when his name is called, he says, here am I. And now he's saying, who am I? Who am I to go? With that question, he begins this effort, Moses does, to talk God out of choosing him. He, in this chapter and the next, gives five objections to why he should be the one to go and speak to Pharaoh. Do we find ourselves in that same place at times in our lives? When we hear God asking us to do something, we're quick to say at first, oh, here am I. And then we hear the details of it and we're like, mm, maybe not me, God. Maybe I'm not the one. We begin to question and, and make excuses. Moses' objections in this chapter and then on into chapter 4 begin with feeling unworthy. Who am I? I'm unworthy. And then I don't know enough to be able to do this. And then as he continues on in this conversation that, as I said, goes into chapters, he, he says he's fearful that, that the people won't believe him and that he just can't speak well enough to carry the message. And then finally, he just flat out asks God to send someone else. How simil similar those excuses are to the ones that we use when we feel God might be calling us to something new. John Holbert puts it this way, Moses is a model for my own unwillingness to perform the work of God. However much I claim I want to do it, his excuses too easily match my own, my self-questioning, my refusal to act for a God I cannot fully understand, my poor skills, my limited oral abilities, and at last, my general hope that God will just go elsewhere to find a servant. So even with all of these excuses, there are two things in this passage that give me hope. The first is that God patiently hears out the excuses. God allows that dialogue to happen. And God gives Moses the opportunity to choose to be called, to respond to the call. When we can openly ask our questions of God, we can come to a fuller, deeper understanding of God.
and a closer relationship with God. Even though Moses recognizes that he's in a holy place, he he hides his face from God, he's taken off his shoes because it's holy ground, he still feels comfortable enough to question and to have this dialogue with God. And that to me says that sometimes we're so aware that God is so far beyond us that, that we won't even question. But here we see God entering into that dialogue and asking questions. The second thing that really gives me some hope from this passage is that God consistently answers the question. And the answer that he gives more than any other is that I will be with you. We don't have to have all the skills in the world because God is with us. That's what he's saying to Moses. You don't have to have every skill and ability because I will be with you. God responds not with the way that we often do to somebody nowadays where we say, oh, you can do anything you set your mind to. Rather, God makes a promise to be present with Moses in this process. The success of the mission doesn't depend on our own ability and power, but on God's presence in that place. In the end, Moses doesn't have to trust his own abilities. He has to trust in God. That is an easy thing to say, to say trust in God. It is much harder to do that. There's an old story about a man who falls off a cliff and as he's falling, he he grabs a branch and he's hanging there and he says, is anyone there? And a voice comes back and says, yes. And he says, well, who are you? And he said, I'm God and I want to save you. And the man says, okay, what do I do? And God says, let go of the branch. And the guy says, is there anybody else up there? (laughs) It is hard to trust God. It's easy to say, it is much harder to do. And I went looking for some some good illustrations of of how we trust God. And I realized that trust is one of those um, experiences in our life that you have to, to experience it to understand it. Have you ever been on a trust walk or a trust fall? Those both are are activities that I have often done with youth through the years. Um, A trust walk, there's partners and one is blindfolded and one is not. And the one who can see is supposed to lead the person who's blindfolded through an obstacle course. And they have to learn to trust the other person to lead them safely through that. A trust fall might take a little bit more trust in my opinion. You, You stand on a chair or a platform and you fall backwards. You just fall and there are people standing there with their arms out both on both sides and they're there to catch you. In that moment when you're standing there on that platform and realizing that you are falling backward and you just have to believe that those people will catch you, that is trust. You have put your well-being, your safety in someone else's hands and you are believing that they will take care of you. When we trust in God, we are placing our well-being in God's hands. We are believing that God has our best interests at heart. Those um, trusting God is something that we develop that we have to continue our relationship with God growing closer so that we can believe that God really has our best interests uh, at heart in caring for us and calling us to do tasks. Just as God called Moses to this hard task of speaking to Pharaoh, of, of saying the things that God had put into his mouth, God called him to that task, but God promised to be there. For many of us, we we never see a burning bush, (laughs) but we might hear a whisper in our ear of God calling us to do something, to step out in faith. And in that, we are trusting that God is with us, 
that we've truly heard God's voice and that we might not have all the abilities we need. We might come up with all the excuses, but none of that will matter if God is with us where we're going. Trusting in God is like that trust fall, that at some point we just have to let go. We let go of our objections, our excuses, and instead of saying, who am I? We really do say, here am I, Lord. Use me because I trust that you will be with me. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, who revealed yourself to Moses in the burning bush, who you chose and called to be your instrument in saving the Hebrew people, Today, we long for that burning bush in our own lives, a sign that you are really there. Yet when your voice comes to us, often we mistake it or, or we want to just give you our objections and our excuses. God, thank you, though, for giving us the freedom to voice those fears. Help us to learn to trust you more. Help us to know that if you have called us, you will be with us. And each day, might we truly trust more in your presence in our lives. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Might you go listening for where God is calling you. And when you hear that call, might you follow knowing that God goes with you. Amen.